The Texas Chainsaw Massacre is the best horror film ever made. I could argue that it's the best film of any genre if I felt so inclined, and I often do. It's a film that essentially reinvented the horror genre, putting into place elements that have long since become cliches and yet still work with powerful effects here, five decades on, and offers a structural style that the best of the genre has tried to copy but never quite matched. It takes the reinvented modern day realism that the genre moved towards in the early 1970s and grafts it onto a new form of delirious gothic grandeur. And it's relentlessly insanely horrifying and often absurdly funny. No other movie, not even Toby Hooper's own out of control sequel comes close to matching the sheer levels of hysteria and madness shown here. And no film so perfectly manipulates the audience from the opening moment, bringing them to such a state of expectation that when the horror actually kicks in, it's almost a relief. I first heard of the film, I guess, around 1976, when my dad mentioned this movie called The Chainsaw Massacre, that was apparently so shocking that it had been banned by the British censors. At the time, I had no idea that that was not exactly unusual, and presumably, neither had my father. The fact that the ban had made the news perhaps spoke to how significant the film was. Over the next few years, I would see mentions of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in horror magazines and books, almost always dismissive and often outraged. To read the critiques of Alan Frank or the reviews in House of Hammer and Cine Fantastique, you would think that the film was an irredeemable bloodbath with no artistic value. But the dismissive reviews only made it seem somehow more alluring. There was something about this film, a film which you rarely saw stills from and certainly never read an interview with anybody involved in. It was an enigma. And then came VHS and the film was suddenly out there for everyone outside London, even car workers in Birmingham, to watch and enjoy. While James Furman's BBFC stubbornly, doggedly continued to refuse it a certificate, it didn't matter anymore. The availability of the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, by far the most high-profile banned film to appear on videotape at the start of the 1980s, showed both the impotence and cluelessness of the British censors. Few people who watched the film at the time could figure out why it was still banned, and significantly, it never became one of the video nasties. At the height of that particular moral panic, no one thought that this film was obscene or dangerous. No one except James Furman, it seems. The moment that our family got a video recorder, the Texas Chainsaw Massacre was on my radar. Despite their misgivings, my parents told me that I could rent the film when we first joined the video club. I was 14, and to my shame, I chickened out. The film's reputation suggested something that might be too much to take. The strongest stuff I'd seen at that point were the horror films that showed up on TV. Universal horror, hammer horror, and the like. And this was clearly something far beyond that. We rented The Omen instead. Over the next couple of months, I built up to it with films like Zombie Flesh Eaters, which, even in its BBFC-approved version, was far gorier than the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, as it turned out. Eventually, I could no longer resist. I rented the film on a hot summer weekend and watched it with a school friend in the middle of a humid afternoon, curtains drawn. It was a strangely, accidentally appropriate atmosphere to see the film in. The film was unlike anything that I'd ever seen. It surpassed any expectations that I might have had. Even in the revolutionary days of early 1980s home video where every other movie was an education and a step beyond anything that my limited viewing experience had previously encountered, everything from David Cronenberg's shivers to Lasse Brown's sensations, this became a defining moment. Here was a film that reinvented horror. Everything that I'd seen before suddenly felt very ordinary and safe. This was a movie that seemed inherently unhinged and alien, a film of images, sounds and moments that lodged themselves into my consciousness and never left. It felt like a masterclass intention, a film that created its fetid atmosphere so perfectly that you could almost smell the decay and the sweat. It felt subversive then and it feels even more subversive now. 
Years of imitations, satires, sequels and remakes have simply made the original feel all the more remarkable for its ageless potency. It remains a film unlike anything that came before or after. So perfectly effective that even now there are people who have seen it and believe that it's a gore fest. The film's power to manipulate you into filling in the gaps and thinking that you've seen far more than you actually have is perhaps its greatest and most underappreciated quality. The opening moments of the film are a textbook exercise in setting the audience on edge. The text scroll and voiceover are calmly telling us that bad things are going to happen to everyone in the movie and implying that this is a true story without ever actually saying so gives way to camera flashes of decayed body parts and that noise a discordant, startling sound that's somewhere between an animal squeal and scraping metal. Cut to wired up, rotting corpses that remain some of the most grotesque ever seen on film and a radio report about grave robbing in Texas before we then go to the opening titles backed by sun flares and Wayne Bell's industrial score. The most vital, unsettling and entirely essential score in cinema history, Bell's music is nearer sound effect than traditional film score and is a massively important part of what makes this film work. Replacing it, as some have been wont to do, would be a crippling act of cultural vandalism. This is the most jaw-droppingly powerful opening sequence in film history. It sets you immediately on edge as it builds intensity and sheer anticipation of what might be to come. Seeing the film on VHS and a CRT TV screen, these opening scenes were murkily indistinct and somehow all the more unnerving. There's much to admire about the fact that we can now see the Texas Chainsaw Massacre in a restored 4K version that's probably better than any theatrical print was back in the day, but sometimes the resolution becomes too good. There was something immediately visceral about not quite knowing what those opening camera flashes were revealing. The vague images and the discordant sounds creating a sense of unease and tension. I was used to the orchestral literalism of James Bernard's Hammer Horror Scores, so this was something new. Even now, no movies quite match the unsettling vibe of Bell's score a soundtrack that has the same startling effect as fingernails on a blackboard. The film skillfully sets us up to expect the worst right away. Even as we meet the main characters, we hear a radio news report that is nothing but a litany of horror, death, murder, mutilation and assault. The film subtly letting us know that the events that are about to unfold are not even that unusual in 1974 America. The kids are investigating whether Sally's grandfather has been dug up in the grave robbing atrocities and checking out the old family farmhouse, now entirely dilapidated. En route, they pass the local slaughterhouses and pick up a hitchhiker, played with twitchy intensity by Ed Neal. Modern audiences are especially horrified by the idea of picking up hitchhikers, but it wasn't so odd in the freewheeling post-hippie age that this film was made in. Movies like this would probably make that seem a far less attractive proposition for people. He's an odd sort, to say the least. A large birthmark on half his face and a personality that hovers between harmlessly, excitedly subnormal and dangerously psychotic. When he slices his own hand open with a knife, starts a fire in the van and cuts Franklin with a razor, the audience is already reeling. If this is the setup, what the hell is coming next? It's a smart move from director Toby Hooper and co-writer Kim Henkel because this is already unlike anything that horror movie audiences would have seen before. It's also, ironically, one of the goriest moments in the film and this immediately sets the audience up to think that they've seen far more than they actually have. A fun game I used to play was to pick up film reference guides, go to the Texas Chainsaw Massacre entry and see what was written. If the film was described as a bloodbath with entrails flying, as it often was, then you knew the book was written by somebody who couldn't really be relied on as a critic. This opening sequence further puts the viewer on edge, expecting the very worst. The film also unsettles us by cutting scenes abruptly, sometimes almost mid-word, giving it a breathless quality that wallows in your subconscious. 
Even when nothing much is happening, the film has an intensity that's almost exhausting. Hooper doesn't need overt acts of violence to build up the tension and the feelings of growing disgust. A mass of daddy long legs in the corner of a room or a few unidentified bones lying around will do the job just as well. The film manages to make the ordinary seem sinister. Hooper can make a simple shot of Franklin struggling to get his wheelchair over a door entrance seem almost unbearably stressful at this point. And so, when Kirk and Pam head out to a long, dried-out swimming hole and then spot a farmhouse where they could hopefully buy some gas, the audience is already at breaking point. Still, no one was quite ready for what came next. As Kirk enters the house and wanders towards a doorway, squealing noises on the soundtrack, animal skulls on the wall, Leatherface, played by Gunnar Hansen, appears, lifts a hammer, smacks Kirk in the head and then drags his twitching body through the doorway before slamming the steel door shut. Bang! The single most apocalyptic moment in horror film history right there. It all happens so quickly that the viewer barely has time to recover from the shock before it's over. Horror films just didn't do that back then. In fact, they still don't. Kirk's death is the turning point. From this point onwards, it's essentially full throttle madness. Pam enters the house and stumbles into the bone room, a room full of skeletons, teeth and feathers and a caged chicken hanging from the ceiling, some of which are being made into furniture, before Leatherface grabs her and hangs her on a hook to wait her turn as he chainsaws Kirk into bite-sized pieces. Then Jerry shows up looking for them and is also dispatched with a single blow without ceremony or spectacle. We're used to horror films dragging out the violence and the deaths, but this movie just gets them out of the way immediately. At this point, you almost feel sorry for Leatherface as he panics, wondering where the hell all these people are actually coming from all of a sudden. It's easy to assume, as other chainsaw films did, that Leatherface could be played by any big guy in a mask, but Gunnar Hansen actually gives an intelligent, nuanced performance throughout the film. Looking at this movie from a radical viewpoint for a moment, and it becomes the tale of somebody whose home is constantly invaded by trespassers. In Texas, it's apparently legal to shoot people who enter your property uninvited, and in a parallel universe, Leatherface is the hero, arguably acting in self-defense against home invaders. Finally, the bickering Sally and Franklin go in search of their missing friends, and Franklin is made short work of by Leatherface, who then chases Sally through the woods as she screams and screams and screams. In fact, Sally rarely stops screaming for the rest of the movie, first hiding out in the death house before escaping, the first of two dramatic jumps through a glass window for her, and then making her way to the service station that we'd seen earlier. Back then, the proprietor had explained that he was out of gas and offered what would soon be the sort of advice given in every rural horror movie, namely not to hang around or go poking about in other people's property. So the kids can hardly say they weren't warned. Unfortunately for Sally, her rescuer is part of the same crazy family that includes Leatherface, the hitchhiker, and their ancient grandpa. And soon she finds herself tied to a chair as guest of honour at the world's worst dinner party, tormented, mocked, and abused. This is perhaps the most relentlessly insane scene in cinema history. Apparently as hellish and hysterical to shoot it is as to watch, it's a non-stop series of screaming, howling, and psychological torture with Hooper and cinematographer Daniel Pearl filling the screen with choppy close-ups of Sally's teary eyeball as the soundtrack becomes ever more intense and everybody goes full throttle crazy. Not all acting, so the stories of the sweaty, rancid, all-day shoot go. It feels like it would never stop. It's the ultimate horror movie nightmare because it pulls you directly into the experience. I've often said that Lucio Fulci's zombie flesh eaters should be shown in cinemas with the heat on full blast and rotting meats in the air vents for the full immersive effect. But that's even more true of this film, or at least this scene. You can almost smell it, the atmosphere is so potent. When Grandpa is handed a hammer that he can barely hold to kill Sally, the film reaches a new level of delirium. 
It's entirely understandable that audiences in 1974, for whom this was all very new, would react so physically to the film. Even now, when we've seen hundreds of movies that riff on the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, this still feels like an assault on the censors. Sally's second escape leads to the film's finale, and it's a shock to realise that this hasn't all been taking place in some isolated location. They are literally right next to the highway, and it's broad daylight. Her ordeal has lasted all night. The final shot, a frustrated Leatherface waving his chainsaw insanely before a sudden cut to black, is iconic and unforgettable. And it offers us no respite from what's gone before. We know he's still out there. It's honestly hard to find fault with the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. We might question the final moments where Sally and her rescuer get back out of the truck that they've climbed in. I mean, surely the chainsaw wasn't capable of carving through a steel door. But it's a minor moment, maybe explained away as a panicked reaction. People do stupid things when they're terrified. But really, this is the perfect horror film. While the movie has a lot of dark humour, none of it seems forced or awkward, and it all fits within the demented family dynamic of the story, so it's unsurprising that it went over the heads of most audiences at the time. Lots of the comedy is rather subtle too, like the service station attendant who continually gets up to wash the van whenever Jim Sedow's character returns to offer more advice to the passengers. Subtle moments, but they're effective. Amazingly, some people have scoffed at the acting in the Texas Chainsaw Massacre, but this is actually a film full of great performances. Jim Sedow is astonishing as the ostensibly more stable member of the family, torn between enjoying the killing and torture and being more responsible. Usually within the same moments, his ability to be both disapproving and excited almost at the same time is fantastic. And he provides much of the film's humour with his continual outrage at his family's antics and his genuine creepiness. Ed Neal is horrible and creepy, the worst character you could ever want to see on screen. And Paul Patain does a great job as Franklin, being absolutely annoying yet still somehow sympathetic. He's far from the sentimentalised cripple that we tend to see in movies, and while we might feel for him when the others mock and neglect him, it's also quite easy to understand why they might find him continually annoying. As for Marilyn Burns playing Sally, what can you say? When you talk about gutsy actors, she should surely come close to the top of the list. She spends so much of the film running and screaming, covered in blood or being thrown around and beaten up, jumping through windows without hesitation, I'm guessing that the film didn't have a full stunt crew covering the more physical requirements, so it's most likely that all of this is on her. Her hysterics are worryingly convincing, and she essentially sets a standard that no final girl has ever come close to matching. Every aspect of this film feels like a masterclass in horror cinema. Yeah, there's something here, some indefinable moment that just can't be copied, which is why no one has really come close to making anything like this since. You can imitate the individual elements, you can make what was once original into the cliched, and you can dilute the characters with remakes and sequels that offer needless detail and backstory. But no one, ever, has come close to making a film that so perfectly, relentlessly brutalises the audience as this. There are certainly several other horror films from the 1970s that are a perfectly crafted example of the genre but none of them quite on the same level as the Texas Chainsaw Massacre. Toby Hooper never managed to make anything like this again. You have to wonder if it was a fluke that everything came together so perfectly, or he simply burned himself out with this movie. Like Orson Welles with Citizen Kane, Hooper spent the rest of his career in the shadow of his earliest work. Not his first film, admittedly, but the first one that anyone had really seen. This film remains the ultimate horror movie experience, one that transcends any idea of genre limitation and remains so unique in its look, atmosphere, sound and intensity that it will never age. Fifty years on, this film still leaves unsuspected viewers traumatised. How many movies can we say that about? So I'd love to hear your thoughts about this movie and its legacy. Let me know what you think in the comments. Do you agree that it's the greatest of all time, or do you think that it's overrated? 
And if you enjoy these kind of critical deep dives, then please subscribe, like, share. Every interaction helps us. Thanks for watching. I'll see you again soon.